Uh, this morning we're starting a new series on the seven deadly sins. So as we're just going to jump right in, you're going to have to be patient with my voice. I've been a little sick this week, so I'm going to try my best to get through this. But a little background as we get started on the seven deadly sins. So first of all, the list is not found in the Bible, although the Bible has uh, plenty to say about these topics. So even though there's not a list, if you're looking, where can I find that? There is a list of, of seven sins. It's in Proverbs. And uh, it'll say something like, there are six detestable things that the Lord hates, uh, seven of them, and then they list seven of those, but that's not the list that we're actually talking about. This particular list that we know as the seven deadly sins has its roots um, of, these, uh, of these particular seven that go all the way back to the fourth century. Started with a guy by the name of Evagrius of Pontus, who spent his last 17 years of his life as a monk, and he came up with these eight general thoughts that he felt like all other sins flow from these eight big ideas, these eight big thoughts. And then a couple centuries later, Pope Gregory the Great came, uh, looked at those eight, but then whittled them down to seven. So this really dates all the way back until the sixth century, and this is the list that we have today. And these are the seven that we're going to look at for the next seven weeks. Pride, envy, wrath, greed, sloth, gluttony, and lust. So some of you may be thinking, man, this is a pretty heavy list. I mean, this is a big deal. I'm not even sure I need to be here for this list. Like, I don't really struggle with these things. And so I would encourage uh, and say to you that if you feel that way, that you've actually just committed the first of those, pride. So you're in the right place. We all live here. This is our life. And let's just throw out the degree thing, okay? I mean, some of you have a tendency towards one of the seven or a few of the seven. Um, some of you may struggle with all seven. Um, I think we can all relate certainly to all seven at some point. I can in my life. We all can at some point in our life that we deal with these. And let's not worry so much about degree, okay? We, we all fit somewhere on here. This is, this is our life. And I think it's important to note as we start down this path for these seven weeks that um, this is not in response to what we heard last week. If you were here, we heard this amazing, humble, courageous confession right here from one of our beloved members. And this is not in response to that. This has actually been um, thought about and prepared, and we've been moving this direction for a few weeks now. So I just think that's important because I don't want us to think that, oh, this is, now we're all of a sudden talking about this based on what we heard last week. Here's what we had said a couple weeks, two or three weeks ago, that this would be our goal for this series. And you can look at it with me here on the screen. The goal behind this series is to learn how to live a life of consistent victory over temptation. Wouldn't that be great? We as individuals and as a church family have greater personal joy, more unity together, and a stronger voice in the world when we live differently than the world. Although, of course, we will never get it perfectly this side of heaven. So to belong to Emmanuel, this theme that we've been looking at for the last four weeks, to belong to Emmanuel is to help one another with our struggles. Listen, we don't just belong by coming here and looking this way. We belong to one another by connecting with each other. And so as we belong to Emmanuel, we help each other with our struggles by confessing, encouraging, and building each other up in our daily walk with Christ. So really what we saw last week in this confession, that may not be you standing up here on a platform and confessing to two or 300 people, but that might be you to a friend or to your community group or to somebody who can help you with one of these seven. As a backdrop to the series and a picture of how sin works, I want to begin just by reading a story from the Old Testament that, that um, we will see some of these uh, sin qualities involved in the story. And you're probably familiar with it, but we're going to see greed and pride, and there's an element of lust, not in the sexual sense, but 
but certainly it's there, and the consequences that these sins bring. So you remember that Israel was delivered out of Egypt. They're making their way to the promised land. They did not believe in God and what God was providing for them, and so they were stuck in the desert for a long 40 years, and then finally it came time with Joshua to lead God's people into the promised land. So they've crossed the River Jordan. They've got this new space. God has promised this, this land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. It's a beautiful, awesome place for them to be. And so here they are. They're in this new place, but now they have to take the territory. And the first place that they have is Jericho. And so in this land of Canaan, uh, there are people in Jericho that they have to overtake. And so in Joshua chapter 6, let me just read the story. It's not on the screen, but I just want to read it for you. So if you can just tune in for a moment, and then we'll get, real more, uh, get more practical. So here's what it says in Joshua chapter 6. As the Israelites are moving into this new land, Jericho and everything in it must completely uh, be destroyed as an offering to the Lord. So God said, basically take no prisoners. Let's go, and you're to destroy everything in Jericho. There was an exception with Rahab and, uh, and her house. The Lord said, do not take any of the things set apart for destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, and iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. Then the Israelites burned the town and everything in it. Only the things made from silver, gold, bronze, and iron were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. And then you know the story. So they take Jericho and God provides this amazing miracle. The walls come tumbling down and, and here they are. They're making their way into the promised land. And then there's the next battle. And it's a small town. Uh, the battle against Ai, A-I. And they're making their way in and it's gonna be an easy defeat. And they take some spies and they go look at the land and they come back and say to Joshua, hey, we only need two or 3,000 soldiers here. This is an easy take. And so here they go and march into Ai. But then they get defeated, and they have to retreat. And during that retreat, 36 soldiers are killed. And Joshua is confused, and he goes to the Lord, and the Lord reveals the reason. And the Lord says, Israel, and this is in chapter 7 of Joshua, Israel has sinned, broken my covenant. They've stolen some of the, uh, of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but they lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. So then this search begins. Who, who stole the items? What happened? And if you remember the story, they took the tribe by, they went tribe by tribe and clan by clan and family by family and man by man and the man is, his name is Achan. And Achan is discovered and he says, it is true that I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. Well, so, so now what happens? Well, some of the most difficult words in the Bible, in one of the hardest chapters of the Bible, then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, tent, and everything he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. Then Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burned their bodies. They piled up a great heap of stones over Achan, which remains to this day. This is why that place has become the, called the Valley of Trouble ever since. So the Lord was no longer angry. Aren't you glad you came this morning? Isn't this just all great news? Tough stuff. This is very hard. So to begin, here are the two things we're going to, we're just going to look at two things quickly this morning as we approach this topic, and they are the why and the how. Why are we focusing on this? 
Like, what is the big deal? Why are we talking about sin? And secondly, how do we find victory? So that's what we're going to do. Let's just look quickly at the why, and we'll spend most of our time here. Uh, first of all, let me just, let's just throw this out. Because these sins, we are looking at this, the seven deadly sins, first of all, because it magnifies the gospel. It magnifies Jesus Christ. When we look at this, this is the backdrop that brought our salvation. So this is not really a downer message for seven weeks. This is a positive message because this is what brings us to a place of salvation. Achan received the judgment for his sin. He was stoned, his family, his children, all that he, uh, everything that he owned brought judgment upon him. The story of the gospel in the New Testament is, is that we have done the same as Achan. We have done these things. And Jesus Christ came and he died for us and he took our punishment. So to look at the seven deadly sins is to say, what a great God that we have. This is the gospel. We magnify the gospel by looking at the seven deadly sins. And says in 2 Corinthians chapter 15, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins. No longer does he count our seven sins or 77 sins or 777 sins. He doesn't count those against us. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So what a positive thing for us to focus on. Tim Keller speaks of the gospel this way. He says, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. And that's true of us. Listen, let's not pretend. We can look within and see at least a glimpse of our depravity. You don't see it all. Given the right circumstances, given the right situation, if you were born in a different family or if you were born in a certain kind of a part of the United States in a certain kind of neighborhood, no telling where you would be. We condemn and we judge so quickly, but, but the gospel says that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. And so you know what you've done, and it's not a fraction of what you could have done. We are so sinful, according to the scripture, but yet at the very same time, we are more loved and more accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. That is the gospel. That as rotten and filthy as I am and that this describes my life, it magnifies the gospel for what he has done with us, much like, as you've heard before, a black velvet uh, behind a diamond only magnifies the brilliance and the contour and the angles and the radiance of that diamond. So our sin magnifies the gospel. Second, another reason why are we looking at this is because at the root of these seven sins is the pursuit of something or someone other than God who is the only one who can truly satisfy the soul. So when you think about why do I tend to be greedy? Why do I move towards pride? Why do I do these things? It's because I'm gravitating towards something that I think will fill my soul other than God. Why would Achan, in a brand new territory, the promised land, milk and honey and all of these provisions that God was getting ready to make for him, why would he take it upon himself to hide and bury something in his tent? Because he was trying to satisfy something in his own life. And this is what we do. And so we're looking at these because we need to recognize how we gravitate towards those things and how we cannot do that in our lives. Jeremiah chapter 2 says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, where they can be filled and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Just two sins. They turned away from what would satisfy. Achan turned away from the living God that would satisfy him in this promised land. And he turned to something that he thought would bring him satisfaction. And we've all been there. I think of, of my own life as a pastor. 
and I hunger for God to do something fresh and new in this place. And sometimes I just ache for that. I mean, I just, I just am like, God, do something so fresh, do something so new. And then I'm reminded, that's not what satisfies my soul, really. I mean, God could do something so miraculous in this place, and, and it would be wonderful to see, and I pray for that to happen. But you know what really satisfies my soul is when I'm alone with Christ, and I just sense his presence, and I'm full. Is that true for you? That's, what, that's the only thing that can satisfy. Jesus Christ is what will satisfy your soul. And we see this over and over displayed in the scripture. Adam and Eve in the garden were promised something by Satan that would satisfy them. But it could never deliver. Proverbs 28, 14 says, happy are those who fear the Lord. And this term fear does, is not the negative kind of fear. There are two uh, Hebrew words or uh, distinctions of fear. One is the negative where you're afraid of something. So if you're, let's say you're afraid of a mouse, you know, and, and the, that mouse is in your office or in your bedroom or in your house. And if it's like my house, I mean, if we see a mouse that scurries across even the garage floor, my wife says, see you later. I'll be back when you take care of that mouse. So that's one kind of fear is it just con, c- completely consumes you. You're so afraid. And it's all about you. The other kind of Hebrew word for fear is positive in the sense that you're so delighted in who God is that you're not even in the picture. It's like the perfect day in creation. Maybe you're skiing or you're doing whatever, and you're just enjoying God's creation, and you are worshiping all day long, and before you know it, you're not even thinking about you. All you're thinking about is the glory of God. So when you delight in God, that's what we're trying to do here is by saying, why do I keep running to these things that never satisfy? Maybe there's another option, and I can find that in God. That's the second reason why we're doing it. Here's the third, is that God's plan is for us to be image bearers as we delight in him. See, when, God's mo- when his people were moving into Canaan, God wanted a representation of light to be among these people. And God's people were always blessed to be a blessing. And so as they were moving in and God was having them take over these cities, they were also to be a light unto the nations. And so what happens is, is Achan immediately begins to take on the character qualities of the people that they were supposed to be destroying. He was not being an image bearer for God, but he was imaging the world around him. And that's why we're looking at this. How do we do that? It's like an automobile design. Let's just say that, there, that there's a, uh, one of you is a, an automobile designer. And let's just say that you have designed something amazing and it's, let's say, the Ferrari. Uh, Ferrari. And so it's like you put the, you con- conceive of the idea, you draw it out, you get engineers to put it all together, you put it into uh, production And then you're there and you can't wait for this automobile to come out. And out comes a Chevy Impala. And you're like, really? I just, that is not what I pictured. That is not what I designed. This is why we are studying on this topic is because God has designed you as a new creation to reflect something very different that we will look week by week that will go on this side It doesn't mean that we don't struggle with these. Of course we do, and we can all relate to that. But this lifelong process is for God to have us look more like his son, Jesus Christ. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Hebrews 12, God's discipline is good for us that we might share in his holiness. And so as we'll see from week to week, That as we look more like Christ, instead of being prideful, there's humility. Envy turns to respect. Wrath turns to mercy. Greed turns to generosity. Sloth turns to diligence. Um, Gluttony turns to restraint. And lust turns to purity. That's what we're after. Perfect? No. But looking more and more like Christ every day. Here's another reason why we're studying this is that they are called seven deadly sins for a reason. Because they kill. Sin kills. Achan's sin brought death. And yes, 
we've already talked about and established the fact that, praise God, it magnifies the gospel because he took our sin upon himself, but sin kills. 36 people, soldiers were dead. He died. His family died. The consequences of our sin, even though judgment has been provided for us and we have been set free, all of us can testify of how sin damages and steals, as Jesus said, and kills and destroys relationships. It hurts. It brings pain on the people around you and in your own life. And the consequences are grave. And so we look at this topic because we want to avoid that kind of pain in our lives. John Owen a 17th century theologian on the importance of fighting sin. He wrote a book called um, uh, The Mortification of Sin. And here is a statement he said that uh, out of that, be always at it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. And we're like, hey, I got a little greed. Okay, I got a little lust. Uh, You know, I'm gluttonous at times and so forth. And yet, it's like sticking your toes into a shark-infested pool. Because Satan's intent is to grab a hold of your foot and start wherever he can. And so, we are looking at this to learn how to avoid the consequences of what can be so painful. Genesis 4, 7 says that sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you and you must rule over it. What a picture. Peter uses almost the same vivid picture that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking somebody to devour. Like this is is very serious. John 10.10, 10, as Jesus, we already said, came to give life, but there's a thief who steals and kills and destroys. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Here's a great picture of what James says about this. Jesus' brother said, temptation in, in James chapter 1, temptation, let's just read this together. Let's read it out loud together. Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth birth to death. You know, in many ways, sin is like a parasite. And I don't know if you've ever had a parasite. I think I have. I I I came back from a Mexico trip one time, and uh, man, I just didn't feel right. And so, you know, I try to take care of that, and Two or three days later, it was like, hey, I'm cured. I think I'm okay. And then maybe a week later, it came back, and it was like, ugh, I just feel horrible. And so I had digestive issues and just, you know, all of this trouble going on in my body, and I just couldn't figure it out. And so week after week, and it was like, I cannot get rid of this problem. And so finally, I went to the doctor and got the right kind of medication. But that's how a parasite works. A parasite enters your body, and it lives off of its host, and it feeds on its host, and it continues to grow. And did you know that that parasite, and I looked this up, can turn, did you know that a worm inside of you, this is gross, so you might want to close your ears, a worm inside of you can get to 100 feet in length. That is nasty. And that is sin, that it gets conceived inside of you And it gives birth to death. And so we look at this to say, God, help me by the power of the gospel. Because I see the damage that it can do in my life. Then we need, uh, we, we look at this because, fifth, we need a culture that makes sin, while not acceptable, normal. And I think this is probably my hardest one. Because we don't confess sin or our struggles very well with people around us. And I just just pray that God would help us to be a culture where people can walk in and feel like, hey, I'm with other sinners. You know, it's like we have this, where there's a culture where there's freedom to be real. 
And I just, I fear sometimes that we're just so not that, that we can't humble ourselves before other people for whatever reason. So what if we became more like a hospital where it was normal to say, I'm struggling with some of this? Because that's really, in the beginning, when this list of seven came up, it was to be a diagnostic tool to help them confess. Not just to evaluate, I've got it, but to confess it and get help for it. But instead, we come to a place like this and we hide and we're guarded, and I do it too. Why can't we be more real and honest? Because of the first one, because of our pride. And yet the scripture says that the most, uh, you know, one of the most liberating things that you'll ever discover is when you're not alone in your struggle. Because the scripture says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. It's common. You're not alone. So let's let this series help us move into this place of being more real. The last thing I can think of, and we're out of time, is why do we deal with this, is that it's for our joy. To grow in all of these areas will, as we said in that original statement, it'll increase your personal joy, bring greater harmony into relationships, and give you a stronger voice in your witness for Christ. But we're going to look at the how, and I'm just going to mention it very fast. That's the why are we doing this. Here's the how. Here's the how. You see, we have what Achan didn't have in the Old Testament. We have this amazing gift. Listen, this is not a seven-week self-help exercise to say, let's all try really hard. Let's do our very best to not be prideful and greedy and wrathful. Let's work at it. Let's give our best effort. We can be better than Achan. No, we can't. But what we have is what Achan did not have. We have the spirit of the living God. The scripture says in Colossians, why do you keep following the rules of the world? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. They seem wise, but they offer no help in conquering evil desires. Galatians 3 says, after starting your new lives in the spirit, why are you now trying to be perfect in your human effort? Here's, let me just show you this picture before we close. Uh, this is um, Romper Room. And just to let you in on a little secret, my wife, this is a TV show back in the 60s, Amy was actually on the Romper Room. Is that amazing? You guys don't seem very amazed. No, that's okay. That's a sympathy clap. You didn't really mean it. And uh, she, that's not her photo, but um, she's got one somewhere to prove it. And so the thing is, is that we were talking about this this past week, is that this is what many people think the church is. They had two basic big ideas. Let's be doobies instead of being don't bees. So doobies means we're going to do all the right things and we're going to be good. And so instead of being prideful, we're going to be humble. And instead of being wrathful, we're going to be merciful. And so the church, in many people's minds, this is what it is. I'm going to do be. I'm going to be good. And I'm not going to be bad. This is not it. The gospel is what? The gospel is that the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life and then helps them to become what God wants them to be, this new creation. It's a whole paradigm shift, a whole new strategy. In Romans chapter 8, in Romans chapter 8, and this is a challenge, and I'm taking it upon myself, that during these next eight weeks, are you ready? Let's memorize Romans 8, verses 1 through 14. And let's counter these seven with what the gospel teaches of how we can overcome and begin to look more like Christ. And how is that? It's by the power of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 12 through 13. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You don't have to live by this anymore. Will you stumble? Yes, of course. But you don't have to live that way. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. We've already talked about that. They're deadly. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. So now we're in a whole new ballgame. 
I have the power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know how exactly how this works, but the last scripture, here's the way Paul said it worked for him in 1 Corinthians 15. For by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul's not saying, hey, look what I've done. I've been a great doobie. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them. So he worked, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. There's the picture. Does it require some effort? Absolutely. But that effort is not in your human strength. The effort is is the Spirit of God nudging you and prompting you and convicting you and saying, oh God, I want to be your man, your woman. And he gives you the power when you submit and surrender and repent and move in his direction. So what do you say? Seven deadly sins. Can we do this for seven weeks? Let's just ask God to bring renewal in our lives, in our family, families, and in our church. Let's pray together.